Hey, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to today's session. Uh, some people are continuing to join us, but one thing I did want to note right from the beginning is that this session is being recorded and it's also being live streamed to YouTube. Uh, so just to take that into consideration during your participation this afternoon. So welcome so much. We have tons of people here. It's very exciting. Uh, my name is Heidi Matthews, and I co-direct the Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, Crime, and Security at Osgood Hall Law School of York University, along with my colleague Francois Tongue Renault. Uh, it's my great pleasure to welcome you all to the center today. We're delighted to see so many friendly faces, many of them old faces and many of them new faces. Uh, despite our large attendance, you will see that we are running today um, as a Zoom meeting and not a webinar. And that's because we really wanted so far as possible to foster a sense of connection and community, something like what we might have if we were meeting together in person. We have a lot of exciting online programming happening right now at the center, including our new seminar series titled Legally Radical, The Role of Law in Emancipatory Struggles. To find out more, you can visit the Nathanson Center website and, of course, follow us on Twitter at Nathanson Center. As you know, today's lecture, titled Neoliberalism and Human Rights, the Role of Human Rights Watch, will be delivered by Philip Alston. Before we begin, I want to take a moment to reflect on the connections, the fellowship, and the responsibilities that come with studying and teaching law in a territory where complex systems of governance, law, spirituality, and pedagogy have long been practiced and indeed are inextricably tied to the land itself. Osgood is located in the area known as Takaronto, which is the traditional territory of many indigenous nations, including the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat, the Métis, and the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. This land is now home to many indigenous peoples and is subject of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. I'd also like to acknowledge the land on which I find myself today, which is situated in the traditional territories of diverse indigenous groups, including the Beothic, Mi'kmaq, Innu, and Inuit of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. So I will now turn the floor to our Dean, Mary Condon, to welcome you to Osgood and to say a few words about the Or Emmett le lecture itself. Professor Obiora Okafor, York Research Chair in International Legal Studies and UN Independent Expert on Human Rights and International Solidarity will then pre present rather Professor Alston. After Professor Alston's lecture, we will have time for questions. Uh, and with that, I will turn the floor directly over to Dean Condon. Thank you so much for being with us today, Mary. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Matthews, uh, for your introductory comments. And uh, on behalf of Osgoode Hall Law School, let me welcome everybody here this afternoon. Of course, uh, we are all very sorry that we can't conduct this lecture and hear from Professor Austin in person. Uh, but one of the few upsides of the virtual environment in which we are all uh, inhabiting, which we're all inhabiting uh, at the moment, is that we can have people attend virtually from many different places. And so I welcome all of you who have joined us this afternoon uh, here to, to hear this, this lecture that I, uh, I know is being um, um, uh, anticipated uh, with great interest. So uh, Professor Alston is, is coming to us this afternoon under the auspices of the annual uh, Or Emmett Lecture, which is presented uh, by the, the Jack and May Nathanson Center on Transnational Human Rights, uh, Crime and Security. The fund which sponsors the lecture was established in 1976, and it seeks to promote through public discussion, research and scholarly writing, uh, public and professional appreciation of the significance of religion, ethics, culture, and history in the development of the legal system. Or Emmet itself means the light of truth. So I think both the framing of this, uh, this lecture and of course uh, the uh, remarks of Professor Alston to come later 
certainly uh, uh, reflect very closely some of the, the significant research and scholarly commitments that Osgood uh, is engaged in through its uh, faculty research, through the work of its graduate students and through advanced seminars that are conducted in uh, our JD curriculum. So many of us as scholars uh, are interested in questions of international human rights. Uh, other, others uh, of the faculty are interested in exploring questions at the intersection of law and ethics, law and, uh, and religion. And of course, uh, a, 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 a number of us in addition to that are interested in the issues that I think will be raised by Professor Alston's lecture, which is questions at the intersection of law, economy and society. So I think for all of those reasons, uh, it's extremely appropriate that we have uh, him uh, coming to address us this afternoon. I know that my colleague is going to do a more fulsome introduction of uh, Professor Alston's credentials and experience uh, and profile. So all I will say at this point is that we're delighted that he is able to join us this afternoon. And speaking for myself, I'm very much looking forward to his assessment of whether Human Rights Watch is indeed watching. Uh, and so uh, I'm looking, uh, looking forward very much to his remarks and I'll turn the floor over to my colleague. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dean Condon. Thank you uh, to the Nathanson Center and its directors. Uh, uh, it's my distinct honor and privilege uh, to introduce to you this year's distinguished OMET lecturer, uh, Professor Philip G. Alston. I just learned about the G yesterday. Um, uh, who is the John Norton Pomeroy Professor of Law at the New York University School of Law and co-director, I think still, of its Center for Human Rights and Global Justice. He was also formerly at Harvard, Fletcher, the EUI, you get the drift. One of the most distinguished international human rights scholars of our time, Professor Alston has had a very strong influence on his discipline, my discipline, our discipline. The many awards and honors that he has received testify eloquently to this fact. For example, honorary life member of the American Society of International Law and an honorary LLD for the University of Maastricht. He was also one of the founders of the European Society of International Law and the European Journal of international law. His original human rights thought across a multitude of topics over a very, shall I say, long time has taught and influenced generations of scholars. He has published many books, including more recently, one of my favorites, The Transformation of Human Rights Fact-Finding, issued by OUP, uh, and a massive and rather head-spinning amount of journal articles, book chapters, and other pieces of scholarly writing. He has also co-authored a leading text in the international human rights field, which I use in my own classes. His human rights practice, or action, if you will, has also contributed immensely to the effort to create a more just and humane world. For example, he worked as a UN, or shall I say senior, UN human rights officer fairly early on in his career. He served twice as a UN Human Rights Special Rapporteur, once in regard to a largely civil and political rights theme, and another time, more recently, with a social and economic rights or largely social and economic rights remit. He was chair and member of the UN Committee on Economic and Social Rights, and he was a special advisor to the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights on the Millennium Development Goals. Perhaps even more uh, importantly, Professor Alston's life's work, his, his life and times in international human rights law has also uh, been characterized uh, throughout, in my view, by praxis. The interplay and fusion of thought and experience as well as theory and action. His action has been largely informed by his theoretical apparatus and commitments and his theory by his practical experience. Of course, there is a sense in which thinking is doing, but 
in his field, at least thinking and doing tend to sharpen each other. And so has it been with Professor Austin. The great importance of such praxis in the human rights field has also been highlighted by Bernard Bakshi, another great international human rights law scholar. Bakshi has taught us for human rights to be fully realized, suffering humanity must be allowed to think on the official human rights register and thinking humanity must also suffer and not just from a surfeit of pleasure. Another remarkable quality about Professor Olson, Olson's work is the way in which he has courageously, in my view, insisted over many moons on confronting the human rights violations of the globally powerful and lived to tell the story. He has shown a human rights touch on the behavior of many states who too easily and too often assume that that kind of touch is meant for some others, the other somewhere else, and is not to be pointed in their direction. Here I have in mind the examples, and these are just a couple of examples of Professor Austin's reports on his fact-finding missions to the US and to the UK during his most recent tenure as the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights. Lastly, since we all live in a neoliberal world and increasingly, shall I say, in the neoliberal university, I must conclude by emphasizing yet again Professor Austin's impact wait for it in the real world. Unfortunately though, I did not take a peek before now at his Google Scholar H index or ITED index or some such almighty metric. What I would say, however, is that um, <laughs> uh, in my own world, which I assure you is real. Professor Alston is a rock star. Indeed, when I eventually grow up, I want to be like him. Welcome to Osgood and the Nathanson Center, Professor Austin. Uh, well, thank you uh, very much for those um, overly generous remarks, uh, Aviora. Uh, and thanks for all the superb work that you yourself are doing and have done. Uh, thanks to the Dean for her welcome. Um, I too wish I could uh, actually be there with you all. Um, but as you say, it's nice to be able to reach uh, an even larger audience through, uh, through this technology. Um, I also just want to say not just hello, but uh, thank you to Craig Scott, who is a, uh, a very long-standing friend. Um, a partner in a number of crimes in the human rights area. Um, I remember vividly him pressing me uh, to join in writing an article um, about the Krutboom case, which was one of the uh, landmark South African cases. But in typical Craig fashion, we were writing it in advance in order to influence the uh, approach adopted by the Constitutional Court uh, on appeal. Uh, but Craig has, uh, has been a wonderful friend over many years and I greatly appreciate his part in this uh, invitation. Um, so to just to set the background in a way um, this is banal at one level, but it is true that we're currently facing a number of so-called existential crises. Um, we um, face climate change, which in many ways is an indirect outcome of um, 40 years of neoliberal policies enabling corporate power and priorities rather than the public interest uh, to prevail. Um, we are facing uh, extreme inequality, which is a very direct uh, product of neoliberal economic policies and their prevalence around the world. And COVID-19, which has really demonstrated for all of us uh, how radically unequal our societies are, 
and the extent to which we uh, tend to um, live in societies that have misallocated uh, resources along racial and gender lines, uh, with the result that our public health care, social protection and other systems uh, have been uh, exposed in all of their weaknesses. And so uh, neoliberalism is very much at the heart of our current preoccupations. My uh, lecture is designed to look at the allegation that is increasingly common, and I'll refer to some examples shortly, that while all of these developments have been going on, the human rights movement has either been sleeping or AWOL. Um, and at worst, that it has been an active enabler or an accomplice uh, in the project of making the world safe for corporate interests and the wealthy elites. Um, one could give many examples of this. Uh, I will refrain, but you might want to think in your mind of an image of climate change. Think of all the consequences that uh, it is having and the far more dramatic consequences it will have in the years ahead. And if you look back at the record of the human rights movement uh, over the last 30 years, remember the IPCC was set up in 1988. So this has been prominent on the international agenda for over 30 years. But the human rights community's record would largely be to say, well, we've stood up for the rights of defenders. Uh, when people have been imprisoned or detained, we've spoken out. We've called for more attention to the right to protest, to the right to freedom to organize and so on. You might get a few additional claims that we've focused on um, various actions by particular corporations which have had very direct environmental consequences. But the bottom line is that when it has come to the really big issues around climate change, most of the human rights community has uh, retreated into legalism uh, and argued or implied that these are really matters for others to address because we lack the expertise, the resources, uh, and the institutional frameworks. To move on and look at what some of the critics have been saying, and I understand that Osgood hosted a talk by Jessica White um, very recently, uh, who has written a, a truly fascinating book uh, on the parallel development of the neoliberal um, philosophy and the modern human rights movement. Um, but the criticisms go way beyond uh, just uh, Jessica White's uh, analysis. Um, just one uh, caveat before I uh, just review some of the literature and so on. I shouldn't normally apologize at the outset of a lecture for the fact that it must be disappointing to some who are listening. Um, the truth is that the lecture today is part of what has become a larger project than I might have hoped, and that the uh, real completion of my analysis uh, is still some weeks at least away uh, and that it won't be until I release the written version uh, that uh, I think many of those who are looking for a more detailed critique will uh, finally have something that they can get their teeth into. Um, nevertheless, um, so in terms of the critics, academic critics, um, 
Mahmoud Mamdani recently, neoliberalism is the handmaiden of human rights. Samuel Moyne, human rights are a powerless companion of market fundamentalism. Uh, Neve Gordon, uh, the convergence between neoliberals and rights practitioners has defanged human rights from any truly emancipatory potential. Joseph Slaughter, in a nice uh, uh, characterization, says that neoliberalism is to neo-imperialism with its contemporary human rights alibi as classical liberalism was to high European colonialism with its missionary humanitarian alibi. Hard to follow perhaps uh, orally, but a powerful uh, critique. Um, Jessica White in particular has emphasized the uh, extent to which, as she puts it, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty actually drew on an account of rights that was central to the early neoliberal project. Um, most importantly, from our perspective, is that these and many other critics go from the analysis to their prescriptions and their prescriptions bode very badly for the human rights community. Um, Mamdani uh, calls uh, upon his readers to bolster democracy in the place of neoliberal human rights remedies. Uh, Neve Gordon, calls for replacing human rights with a new vocabulary of resistance. Uh, Pankaj Mishra um, predicts that the West-led human rights movement will lose legitimacy, which will result in a severe self-reckoning and downsizing. He says that today's youth will no longer fall for a human rights anti-politics miraculously placed beyond political economy. And Samuel Moyne ends by saying that those who want to achieve social justice will not in the future look to groups who look like our human rights movement. The latter use tools that are simply not fit for use in this case, and they should leave the job to other coalitions and explain what little role they have in the overall quest for social justice. So the thrust is pretty straightforward, but at least if you're paying attention to the academic literature, uh, it's no longer a small group of outlying critics who are suggesting that human rights is so fundamentally infused with neoliberal values that it just doesn't have the answers to the biggest challenges on our agenda today. Um, I have chosen to go beyond what a lot of these critiques do, and I'll mention this uh, perhaps again later, but so many of the critiques talk essentially in the abstract. They talk about the human rights movement or the human rights behemoths or whatever. They don't identify them, although they have very clearly in mind the model of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International. But that doesn't lead them to ask, so what exactly did each of these groups do in relation to this broader range of issues? And in fact, there's remarkably little analysis. There's more on amnesty, but there's very little looking at Human Rights Watch and the sort of issues that I'm dealing with now. 
despite the fact that you can't look at the literature on any country situation these days without immediately encountering something from Human Rights Watch, if you go to a number of the more controversial broad issues, HRW is there, as it should be. Um, but the critics and scholars more generally have not actually done the work of studying what HRW has done. So a starting point, which I don't think I need to discuss much in relation to this audience, is just to say that, yes, the human rights system has many component parts. But NGOs, civil society groups, are an absolutely central part of that. Governments are rarely, if ever, the initiators. Uh, they're not at the forefront. They're not putting forward the new ideas. NGOs have the central role to play in that regard. And Human Rights Watch is whatever we think of it, certainly at least one of the world's two leading human rights organizations. And I think if we leave aside the issue of membership in relation to which Amnesty International obviously is many miles ahead because HRW is not a membership organization, uh, it's fair to say that HRW is the most important single human rights organization in the world. Uh, it has a staff of some 500 people, offices in dozens of countries around the world, a budget of $80 million a year, which is set to rise to $110 million within three years. Um, immense expertise among its ranks. Um, and it has in many ways shaped what we understand by human rights fact-finding, uh, and it has become for many the model of a standard human rights organization. I have to uh, put in one qualifier before going ahead with my analysis, and that is to say, that it is a grave mistake, and I promise I'm not falling into it, to equate the broader human rights movement with either Amnesty or HRW or both. The broader human rights movement is vastly more complicated, vastly more heterogeneous. And one of the big problems with a lot of the literature is that the critics don't acknowledge that, pay all, spend all of their time focusing on this sort of standard model that we're about indeed to look at ourselves. But that's only a small part of the picture. First uh, problem is that it's not so easy to um, investigate, if that's the right term, and I'm sure it's not, an organization like HRW. Um, there isn't a lot in the public domain. Um, the records of HRW, um, according to one scholar, um, are sealed, the records of the meetings of the board, the executive committee and the various, various subcommittees are closed until 2055. Uh, so researchers can't actually get any sort of written record. It's very difficult to, for most researchers, I think, to persuade uh, board members uh, or others at the most senior levels to talk very uh, openly about what's going on. And maybe that's normal for any organization, but to the extent that HRW plays such a key role in shaping the overall human rights system, uh, it's essential, I think, that there is 
some greater transparency that can be achieved. There's also a resistance, of course, to criticizing um, an organization that is so important and so valued. Uh, I myself think that HRW has done immensely good work, that it plays a very important role. Uh, and I would be the first to lament uh, any uh, weakening of its role, but I certainly do want it to be changed in terms of its orientation. I know from my own past experience, amusingly, uh, that criticism is very often misinterpreted as a hostile act, or of course, welcomed by the wrong people. I have vivid memories. Um, this is way back, I guess, in the 1990s, as the chair of the UN Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, I sometimes criticized both Human Rights Watch and Amnesty from the podium in the UN Human Rights Commission. And as I walked back to my seat in the hall, I would be greeted very warmly and congratulated by the representatives of countries with which I really wouldn't wish to have much to do. Uh, in other words, they were delighted that I was finally exposing the weakness and the evil even of HRW and amnesty. And so many of us tend to shy away from this sort of uh, critique. Um, so to get into the substance, I'm going to focus, uh, and all too briefly in uh, such a short lecture, on the four elements that I think are the most important. Ideology, methodology, governance, and funding. In terms of ideology, this is a very big project. In other words, to try to map through the immense number of reports that HRW has issued uh, in the course of some 40 years uh, to distinguish from, to distinguish between the country reports, the thematic reports, increasingly the shorter notes, the press statements and so on is a huge uh, endeavor and very difficult to achieve. Obviously, how we see the record of HRW varies greatly depending on where, on who we are, where we sit, what our own ideology is, what we would like to see HRW doing compared to what it actually has done. I would divide up the ideological analysis into two time periods, which are not particularly scientific, but useful, I think. One is 1978 through, believe it or not, 2017. Uh, and the second is the rest, 2017 through today. Um, I've been struck, uh, I, I should say that I've had the great good fortune to be able to talk with quite a large number of people associated with HRW in various capacities. And I've been struck in those discussions by how the perceptions differ dramatically in response to the questions which I take as the key elements of the neoliberal agenda. What's HRW done on economic and social rights? And how has HRW treated the sort of structural, particularly economic structural uh, or dimensions or the, the political economy of rights. And some interlocutors have said to me, well, it's always been a part of our um, analysis. Others will say, well, maybe there was a problem in the early days, but we quickly overcame that. Some will say, well, at least for most of the last two decades, this hasn't been a, an important issue. Uh, 
And others will go all the way in the opposite direction and say, you know, we really owe an apology to the human rights community for our chronic neglect of these issues. Now, I, of course, can't be the sole arbiter uh, of where the, uh, where the truth lies in this regard, but I can do what others haven't yet done, I think, and that is to lay out to gather together more of the evidence that will help any of us to make that assessment more objectively. In the paper that I'm writing, I've simply decided to focus on a number of snapshots. Uh, the first is basically Helsinki Watch, its founding 1978 and so on. And there, of course, the picture is very straightforward. It's an organization designed to uh, assist <clears throat> dissidents in Eastern Europe uh, to discredit the communist government uh, in terms of the way in which it treated uh, individuals and particularly those who wanted to leave the country. So social rights were not at all on the agenda. The second um, moving ahead 15 years is the Vienna World Conference on Human Rights. The World Conference is something of a watershed, um, partly because when the Clinton administration first came to office, they foreshadowed uh, a greater openness to engaging with social rights more uh, systematically and more constructively than had been the case previously. But in fact, HRW was very much present uh, at Vienna in 1993. And I want to tell a, a brief anecdote, <clears throat> um, which I was reminded of earlier today by Craig Scott, in fact. Um, on the day preceding the Vienna, the opening of the Vienna conference, there was a very large NGO conference. And at that conference, there were several keynote addresses given. One of them was by me. Um, I had read shortly before the conference uh, a brand new analysis put out by Arie Nair, the, the, the first executive director of HRW. And he said, the view that economic and social questions should be thought of in terms of rights was not solely confined to the Soviet bloc. It's reflected in several provisions of human rights law. Human rights activists in a number of third world countries have long held the view that both kinds of concerns are rights. Their argument has not proved persuasive in the West and none of the leading international non-governmental groups has become an advocate of economic and social rights. So I said at the, World Con at the uh, NGO conference that REA was wrong on every count, historically, as well as factually. And I called on HRW, of course, to correct this record. At the end of my presentation, Ken Roth, who had just become the acting executive director, uh, approached me and was extremely unhappy with my remarks and thought I had um, treated HRW unfairly. He then um, sent me a letter, uh, which I appreciated. He suggested that I'd used REA as a foil uh, to play to the audience and that it didn't really represent HRW's position. He went out of his way to say that HRW is not indifferent to matters of economic welfare. And he used those sort of euphemisms throughout the letter. But of course, in true to form, there, 
were not references in that initial letter to economic and social rights. We then had a continuing correspondence, which I appreciated. Um, and Ken outlined uh, a number of concerns which would then come to feature strongly in a major policy statement that he put out in 2004, and I'll come to that shortly. But nevertheless, in the official report by HRW of the 1993 conference, we get the same sort of defensiveness that talking about social rights, talking about development is basically something that the opponents of human rights do, that they want to put development first and ignore human rights. And we at HRW are not going to fall into that trap. There's an, another, there's a, a, a quick interlude in my historical survey, which is the Durban Conference on Racism of 2001. And here there's an interesting little um, fleeting interlude. Um, I remember, again, I guess back in the 1980, uh, 1990s, um, Guatemala um, submitted a report to the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which I was then chairing. And the report said, um, the big problem in Guatemala is that it's a patriarchal society uh, and that women are marginalized and oppressed at virtually every level. And I said, <laughs> quietly to the ambassador who was next to me, I said, Ambassador, how the hell did a government produce a report that is so honest and so self-critical? And he responded by saying, I think some goddamn feminist consultant must have been responsible for it. And there's a direct parallel, it seems, with HRW in that at the Durban conference, they submitted an amazing paper on reparations, which basically says that if we put economic and social rights at the forefront of our analysis and we proceed down that road, we will start to make serious progress in terms of understanding the issues associated with racism and the challenges associated with reparations. It turns out that that report had not been seen by the executive director. He was not happy with it, and it disappeared very quickly off the radar screen. It was a blip. Uh, I'm happy to say it's now back on the agenda. It's now being looked at um, much more carefully uh, in the context of a renewed approach or interest in reparations. Uh, we then had the 2004 analysis published by Ken Roth, the executive director in Human Rights Quarterly. And that is much more revealing of HRW's position. Uh, it identifies the key entry points that might be used by any proponent of social rights. And it goes through one by one and says, of course, there's nothing that NGOs can do on this. It then concludes by saying that if a major NGO, read Human Rights Watch, were to do something in this area, it would need to take full account of its methodology. But our methodology at HRW consists essentially of naming and shaming. And for that reason, we need to be able to identify a very clear violation, clear in terms of legal standards and so on, a particular violator, prime. Uh, essentially a government, and a remedy which can be pointed to very clearly 
and demanded in our advocacy. And if we can't do that, then there's not much we can do. What happened, and that policy really played an outsized role within HRW, I would say for at least the decade thereafter. And I certainly remember talking to Ken Roth a decade later, and, and he said to me very openly, I've changed nothing uh, in my understanding. Uh, what I wrote in 2004 still stands. Um, I'll return to that uh, in a moment. Um, the next a couple of um, points along the way are the work done by particularly the Women's and Children's Rights Division, and then next, the Business and Human Rights Division. And each, each of those units will point with quite some justification to very important reports that they put out in the 2000s, looking at aspects of social rights. So the right to education, is taken up in a number of reports. Uh, the Business and Human Rights Division pursued the obligations of corporate actors um, in various dimensions that touch upon social rights. But the bottom line is that during this uh, period, there continued to be a studious avoidance of the terminology of social rights. It was all too rarely used. There was a failure to encourage any sort of broader analytical framework in HRW's general advocacy work. There was very little pressure ever applied on states. Uh, during the Arab Spring, for example, HRW called for the drafting of new constitutions and so on. Those constitutions were never uh, suggested to include social rights. Um, and for the most part, the approach reflected the conclusion that Ken Roth had um, basically put forward in 2004, which was that our most effective entry point is to focus on discrimination. So if we can show that people are being kept out of school because they are girls or because they are of a particular ethnicity, go for it. But the problem is that in fact, that leads to ultimately to a very stunted and constrained approach to social rights. Uh, I don't have time to develop that critique, but it's central. Um, <clears throat> I then, in my paper, and I see that I'm already running out of time, so I better get moving, try to look for what the factors are which might explain HRW's um, position. Um, I've read a, a manuscript of a book that's coming out soon where the authors say, uh, simply, the perceived danger of positive rights explains why Human Rights Watch failed to monitor those rights before the 21st century. And they support that by quoting Arya Naya, saying that authoritarian power is probably a prerequisite for giving meaning to economic and social rights. Now, I think that it's actually a lot more complex than that, and I think we need to dig more deeply. I think that there are several factors that I will, or that I am exploring in more detail. Liberal individualism is an important part of the uh, traditional human rights framework. Um, uh, the State Department, uh, back under Reagan convened a meeting at one stage 
to talk about what they how how the annual State Department reports should deal with these issues of social rights. Arya Nair, who was a part of this then confidential meeting, uh, said instead he wanted to see a wider use of the names of persons persecuted by their governments. That was the key. So this is part of a real individualist focus. Second is the US legal model, which exerts a powerful influence. Both Arya Nair and Ken Roth had distinguished careers uh, in the US legal system before coming to HRW. And both of them, I think, obviously hold very traditional perspectives on uh, the way in which rights should be conceptualized. And that doesn't, of course, include social rights because they are not in the US Constitution. Uh, third is the link between HRW and US foreign policy. This is complicated. Anyone who says that Human Rights Watch is a lackey of American foreign policy is pretty ill-informed. Uh, HRW made its living uh, once it got past the Helsinki era uh, out of criticizing the government, successive administrations. But it's also more complex than that because Leaving aside a strongly antagonistic relationship in relation to a lot of country issues, it's true that given the importance attached by the US in its foreign policy to the economic superstructure, to the extent that HRW challenged virtually none of that, it plays very much into the hands of the critics of neoliberalism, HRW, and human rights. Then the final issue that I'd look to in trying to explain this is what the French call the déformation professionnelle. Uh, in other words, the, um, the extent to which uh, translated, if you get a lot of lawyers in an organization, they're going to do what lawyers do. Uh, and if you don't have a broader array of professional disciplines, it's going to skew uh, the overall outcome. Um, you get then a certain circularity in it all because HRW needs to be based on law, needs to be staffed primarily by lawyers, Therefore, we don't hire people outside in outside disciplines. That in turn then leads to the justifications that run through a lot of the historical record that we can't deal with these issues because we don't have the right personnel. We don't have the expertise and we wouldn't know what to say. But of course, that's true if you have assiduously not employed uh, the right personnel. And we know also that lawyers attach huge importance to precedent that creates a sort of big path dependency where people are not looking backwards, not looking sideways. They're simply going down the path that has already been set. A key part of the neoliberal agenda was HRW's long time insistence on not looking at redistribution, ruling out the issue of resources, fudging it in relation to civil and political rights by saying, as Ken Roth did in 2004, that our recommendations on civil and political rights try to remain modest so that they don't have major resource implications. But that is the classic neoliberal approach where you separate out a narrowly defined human rights policy. And you have this enormous area of economic policy where so much of the real decisions are being made in terms of societal priorities, and they are off limits. They're not entered into. 
Um, let me <coughs> begin to sum up because there's still much that I would like to say, but won't have the time. Um, it is very important to acknowledge that since 2018 and much more dramatically since the onset of the pandemic, HRW has started to adopt a very significantly different approach. Uh, Ken Roth uh, in the latest um, World Report urges the Biden administration to talk about social rights, to talk about a right to health care, to talk about a right to education, uh, a right to food, and so on. This is a real turnaround, at least at the top. Um, you've got the uh, decision to take climate change seriously as a human rights issue, which previously, whatever reports had come out, had not been done in any deep structural sense. Uh, and you've got the sort of recommendations that are coming out around inequality that are linked in particular to COVID-19. And these new approaches, which are really quite stunning if you look at the website and the recent um, emphases, uh, portend a potentially very significant change uh, in approach. Um, I was going to talk, uh, I've only done ideology so far and there's three other things to talk about. So I'm gonna to have to do those in very summary form. Methodology is very important. Uh, I would suggest that the emphasis that Ken Roth put in his 2004 article on methodology uh, is really a question of ideology. Um, but methodology is important. Uh, HRW says these days that it's not just a naming and shaming organization, but the truth is that the legacy of that particular approach is still very vibrant today in terms of how it selects issues, how it approaches those issues and how it follows up. Um, it is not still an advocacy organization that sees its role as being to follow through on reports and work out the ways in which real change can happen at the ground level. Uh, that is, and, and so that's linked to the ways in which impact is measured. And I think again, HRW has a long way to go in terms of coming up with a sophisticated approach to measuring impact. And it tends to use the criteria or benchmarks that hark back to the days of naming and shaming rather than developing a more sophisticated matrix. That in turn then is linked to the question of governance and funding. Uh, there, there's not enough time for me to talk about the governance section. I want to look at the role played by the executive director, the role played by the board, uh, the role played by staff, um, and to draw some conclusions. Let me just make one comment, which is um, an interesting conclusion that is starting to take shape in my mind. Outsiders will look at W and say, the executive directors have been absolutely dominant forces and whatever they've said has been done. Insiders have a dramatically different perspective, which is that yes, on some key issues, uh, there have been significant limits, but in fact, much of the story of working within HRW has been of how to get around the formal limits, how to initiate novel ways of looking at things, how to bring in new norms, how to set precedents that are going to gradually chip away at the general message of avoiding social rights to the extent possible. 
which has, I believe, um, essentially been sent from the top throughout most, if not all of this period. And what we see is a surprising interplay between what the staff has been able to achieve through various reports and what the organization itself has then come to stand for. But I would say nonetheless in concluding that it's very important to now move beyond this sort of, um, I, it's, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to use the term guerrilla warfare, but that's absolutely not an accurate description. But HRW needs to move beyond this sort of constant give and take where precedents are slowly set, gradually exploited, and start to think through more systematically what the policies are and to be more upfront about those. It needs to do that if only in order to change the widespread public perception that it doesn't yet do nearly enough work on social rights or particularly on the structural drivers of human rights uh, in terms of fiscal policy, in terms of inequality and so on, despite making a start on those issues. The final dimension of my analysis will be on funding. Um, again, it's very complex. Um, if you have to raise $100 million every year, you are in ways that might not be acknowledged dependent on funders. Um, if you don't have members and you've got a very small, relatively small board, um, the question is where do policy initiatives come in and how does one change the direction? Uh, there's a very significant critical literature pointing to the influence of funders. That influence is often denied by HRW staff who say, no nonsense, we do what we want to do. Others will say, well, no, that's not entirely the case, but if we really want to do something and we raise money from an individual donor, then it will happen. But I think there is still a broader set of issues that again needs to be looked at more openly than has uh, so far been the case. Let me finish by saying that I do think it's very important, just as we in the human rights community always say to governments and others, that it's important to acknowledge the past. And I think that there is still a very strong reluctance to acknowledge the role that HRW has played over 30 or 40 years and to acknowledge what might then be required if there is going to be a real change in approach. What is gonna be required is training of staff. Um, you can't just say, well, a large part of our staff think they're already doing social rights. There are quite distinctive challenges involved in social rights there is the need to adjust methodology to provide staff with some serious understanding of what the real issues and challenges are. Uh, and I think you also need, of course, to then rethink the professional personnel uh, that are involved if the organization is to really be capable of playing the role that a lot of its current statements would seem to suggest that it wants to. So in a nutshell, I think that a lot of the criticism of the relationship between human rights groups and neoliberalism is fully justified. I think HRW has a lot to respond to in terms of its historical record, but I think the most important takeaway is that HRW now seems to be poised to potentially show that the critics are wrong and to show that a major human rights organization can actually engage with the key elements of neoliberal policy and begin to 
push back in a sustained and meaningful, not just a tokenistic way, but we will see. I'm sorry, I've gone over the time that I had hoped to speak for, but didn't still cover much of my paper. Thanks. Thank you so much, Philip. Uh, that was just so deeply engaging. So with the time we have left, um, there is certainly space for questions. Uh, I will say, if you want to intervene in the discussion, you have two options. You can raise your Zoom hand in the way that we're all quite used to doing right now, um, or you can message me directly using the chat function. And if you'd rather not, or for some reason cannot pose your question yourself directly, you can type it out to me um, and I can read it. In the interest of time, uh, please limit yourself to one question for no more than about two minutes. And given the number of participants, of course, we probably won't get to everyone's questions, but we'll do our best to have um, uh, a meaningful and dis sustained discussion. So uh, with that, I see a hand up already. So Ola BC, go ahead. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Heidi. Uh, and thanks to Professor Alston for a very interesting talk. Uh, I, I do ask this question, noting that you you, you indicated that your uh, your paper is coming in weeks ahead. So permit me if my question is probably addressed in the wider context of your paper. Uh, but I do wonder though, uh, what what the role or what the space is in that paper when we see it uh, for scholarship and scholars. Uh, outside of the Western context. I know you, you mentioned Mahmoud Mandani at the beginning of your, of your talk. Uh, and while, while one acknowledges his work, the truth is also that uh, a lot of the facts you speak to, uh, and, and particularly the naming and shaming context, which you, you I believe noted at the end uh, is justified today, is gaining traction in a lot of the regional courts in, in, in the African context. Uh, and the regional courts. So to circle back, to what extent do you see this paper reflecting movements, ideas, thoughts uh, about human rights uh, in the third world space? Thank you. Uh, Heidi, I should go ahead and answer is, uh, one by one. Is that... Uh... Yeah, I think that we've got about 20 minutes or so, so we'll proceed in that way for now. Thanks. Okay, sure. Um, well, uh, that's, I mean, I appreciate the question. Um, it's difficult, uh, I have to be honest. Um, I started by saying that one of the problems with the literature is that it is unduly focused on what is being done by two major organizations, Human Rights Watch and Amnesty. It has also to be said that the vast majority of the written critiques, certainly the best known ones, are from people, unfortunately, like me, uh, old white males. Um, and if we go to the situation in uh, the global south, we see commentators, scholars, and human rights groups who are certainly critical of HRW in terms of its what's often referred to as an extractive methodology, you know, flying in and flying out, doing nothing to sustain local groups and so on. That's a very big issue. It's one that HRW is grappling with, um, but I don't think so far with the success uh, that one will need to see. Um, but the Global South scholars are not actually focused on the particular narrow issue that I'm looking at. I, I don't want to uh, turn it around on you, uh, Olabizi, uh, just as a dean would when you put up your hand and suggest something and the dean says, good, well, you're, uh, you're the chair of the committee, so look at that. But if you have any suggestions as to literature from the Global South, I would very warmly welcome those. 
Thanks so much. Um, and I should have said this before, but if if everyone asking a question could briefly introduce yourself, that would be very helpful as well. Uh, John Packer, go ahead. Thank you very much, uh, Philip, for that um, uh, very, uh, I think, thought-provoking presentation. And of course, I look forward to reading your materials and it's nice to see you again. Um, Thank you for taking this question up. Uh, I wanted to ask you about a kind of curious element. I don't know if you've observed it. That's, uh, I mean, we know that there is a preoccupation with this uh, victim vi uh, violation remedy approach to be obviously individually oriented in terms of wrongdoers and post facto. It's clearly not a very preventative approach. Uh, it's also not been one that's engaged much on group rights broadly. Um, you, you speak about social rights, but I mean, if we come to cultural rights, it's even thinner. Uh, but the curious question I want to ask you about is genocide. It is uh, quite striking, and I, I have to declare here I'm on the Canadian Committee of Human Rights Watch. I've been trying now for many years, five years, to get an answer out of Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, why they decline to draw a conclusion on application of genocide convention. So precisely an approach that one would think would be in line with the methodology they use. Uh, but for example, even though Human Rights Watch produced two reports on, uh, on prohibition of uh, or interference with birthing uh, with Rohingya, they declined even to mention the Genocide Convention. And here we are now with cases, the Uyghurs, the Yazidis and others, and still silence on the Genocide Convention. And more than that, a bizarre position taken up by uh, Prince Said, for example, in the Office of the High Commission of Human Rights, that they were even precluded, this is now the position of the High Commission of Human Rights, precluded from drawing a conclusion on genocide, and I quote now, unless and until determined by a court of law. I don't know where the heck that comes from. I don't know how you would have been a rapporteur on executions if you were waiting for a court of law to draw determinations and so forth. But I wonder what you just think about this, in my view, odd, inexplicable, perverse position. Um, thank you, John. Um, I gather you're not in favor of it. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it's not for me to try to uh, justify this. I think one of the big challenges for HRW has been the way in which it has located itself as a, an organization based on international law. And one of the things that I give some at attention to in my paper is the outsized role played by the legal and policy department, um, which has to clear every report, has to sign off on every le legal framework and so on. And I think has long been dominated by um, a fear that it will get it wrong, that it will be accused of not being able to support uh, more progressive interpretations. Um, and <clears throat> without getting into the particular merits of the case that you lay out so strongly, uh, I can only uh, suspect without any inside knowledge uh, that it's this sort of deeper set of legal issues that have been raised as to what the implications might be of HRW taking the sort of position that you advocate. Uh, but I can certainly see the frustration. Uh, there's also been, and this, is a, this has been a long time concern of Ken Roth's, this goes back to the liberal individualism, uh, <clears throat> In his correspondence with me back in 1993, Ken was already saying we're very worried that uh, proponents of social rights often put these as collective rights. And of course, we need to make sure that the focus is always on individual rights. And I think that in turn has, um, as you noted, also 
played out in a, a failure, I would say, to engage nearly strongly enough with the rights of indigenous peoples, uh, just to take one particular group uh, because of the fear that they would be moving away from the individualist focus to that of a group and would lose the um, essential characteristic of what they see as legal rights. But I think that's regrettable and problematic. <clears throat> Thanks so much. So the questions are coming in fast and furious to my personal inbox here, but um, I will turn the floor over right now to Malcolm Raga. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, well, thank you very much for uh, this uh, fascinating uh, talk, uh, Professor Alston. I, I have a question about methodology, and um, I, this is this this question actually um, is the same question for you as it is for Jessica White and for Samuel Moyne and, and for some of the other uh, people you've mentioned in terms of this critique, this, this uh, genre of critique, which is, is really in, in some ways what we have. And that's a um, question about, that relates to the problem of causation, uh, is uh, correlation is not causation. And so um, I'm just wondering, what is the, the causal link between these sort of salient points that you've raised, uh, you know, for instance, uh, Human Rights Watch not looking explicitly at redistribution as, as a sort of a salient point in, in, in for uh, the Moyne white critique. Um, but I'm interested in how that, what's the causal connection to complicity with neoliberal, neoliberalism writ large or, uh, or fellow traveler status with neoliberalism. Um, and an, an alternative sort of causal narrative might be that uh, Human Rights Watch's approach over the, while neoliberalism was dominant, was a tactical one. And so that, um, that perhaps what we are looking, you know, what we're asking Neo uh, Human Rights Watch say to take on a more uh, approach that's more favorable to a distribu distributive analysis, whereas Human Rights Watch is interested more in a kind of a tactical approach that's uh, contextual to it being a US based human rights organization. And you mentioned at the beginning of your talk the, the issue of human rights defenders. Perhaps the tactic is to enable uh, the voices of human rights defenders. Uh, and that this is the most, you know, in, in this sense, Human Rights was, Watch was successful in enabling, in enabling the voices of human rights defenders who've, who themselves perhaps are advocating for some of these other, um, for, for the more uh, economic, social, and cultural rights priorities that, uh, it's that the critique wishes, you know, the critique wants Human Rights Watch to be the voice for ESCR rights, whereas Human Rights Watch, perhaps uh, the tactic is, is to give voice to others. So I'm just wondering about your thoughts in terms of whether you've seen evidence of an alternative narrative that is not um, aligned with complicity or fellow traveler status, but rather an evidence of some kind of alternative tactical approach. Um, thanks for that. It's a, a complex question. Um, I mean, I can give you an example, I think, from my own experience in terms of the first issue that you raise about the causal link. Um, I did a visit in 2018 to the United Kingdom in my capacity as Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty. And the United Kingdom was of uh, immense interest to me because it is almost a laboratory for neoliberalism in the sense that you had um, a labor government and uh, so on uh, until the conservative coalition came in in 2010. In 2010, they immediately announced that they were going to adopt a whole series of measures that they called austerity 
But austerity, in fact, had all of the ideological and practical hallmarks of what we think of as neoliberalism. Uh, it was cutting back dramatically on welfare. It was putting responsibility onto the individual. Uh, it was reducing government support for all sorts of social protection uh, and other functions that were not central to the economy. And I was able to look at what the consequences had been as analyzed by a great number of specialist think tanks and other groups in the UK, including, for example, the National Audit Office, whose reports are uh, simply uh, very highly respected by all. And what the picture that emerged was that life expectancy for key groups had dropped significantly uh, in the UK. Child poverty had risen dramatically. Overall levels of poverty had risen dramatically. Levels of destitution were at a point that they had not been at for a very long time prior to that. And there was no real question but that the change in government policies across a wide range of areas had first of all been intended to bring about a lot of the results. And secondly, that those results had to be seen as extremely negative in human rights terms. So I don't think that, uh, and the pushback that I got from the government was very indirect in terms of saying, but we believe that employment is the key. Get people into jobs, that's the key. And they were able to say uh, employment has never been at higher levels. But of course, the reality was that uh, a vast number of people who were, quote, employed were living in extreme poverty uh, because they got none of the supplementary support which any uh, proper welfare state would be providing to people whose earnings in employment are totally inadequate. Uh, and you had other groups like single mothers uh, who were being treated absolutely and still are uh, abominably uh, by the uh, social protection welfare system that exists in the UK. So I had no difficulty, I have to say, and if you wanna look at the reports, you're welcome to do that. Uh, in establishing a pretty clear causal link between neoliberal policies and extremely problematic uh, human rights outcomes. Um, I, I take your other point. The, the issue of tactics is, of course, very much up for up, up to the individual group. You work out how you're going to um, tackle a problem and how you think you can be most effective. But if you, you know, if you say, look, our expertise is in footwear, sorry to give a silly example, um, and you insist on focusing on the shoes because that's what, where we know our thing and the public expects that we know shoes. But meanwhile, the rest of the person's body is being pummeled by a whole range of different actors. You can't say, well, it's tactical because the community we're appealing to doesn't care that the people are being beaten up. Um, you have to, at a certain point, say our tactic is insufficient. Uh, it's not capturing the broader picture. And so when HRW says, as you suggested they would, our role is to ensure that defenders are free to speak and to act effectively. And they're the ones who can then tackle the social policies. The reality is that that strategy hasn't worked. Uh, in, the most, in the vast majority of situations that I'm aware of, human rights defenders, you know, whether it's in the Philippines, whether it's in Central America, uh, whether it's in Poland, um, are under such immense pressure that, yes, it's an important contribution to keep them out of prison or to keep them from being killed and to enable them to make the occasional statement, 
but they're never going to be in any position to change the underlying structural problems that they were originally protesting about. Uh, and I think it's essential for... Now, of course, the, the qualification I'd add, and then I should stop it, is that I agree with what you imply, which is that it's not for Human Rights Watch to take on all of this on its own. There has to be much greater partnership. But again, HRW has almost no record of partnering with groups working on social rights. It does its own thing. Uh, whereas when it comes to civil and political rights, it is much more of a partner. It is encouraging others, facilitating, feeding into other processes. And so I think that points to what is needed as a major change. Are you okay for one last question, Philip? Okay, great. Um, so this is a question that was sent to me uh, as a message. Um, so it's from Amin Saju, who is a faculty member at SFU's School of International Studies, uh, where they teach human rights and international law. Um, and so the question is this. On the issue of Palestinian rights, Israel, the US, Gulf Arab states would be delighted to shift to socioeconomic rights. Indeed, they are seeking to do this at the expense of civil political rights that entail national self-determination. In short, socioeconomic rights claims can be used to effectively bury civil political ones. So that's a, a very old chestnut, if I can put it that way. Uh, Elliot Abrams was famous, 1982, Assistant Secretary of State, for saying the reason why we can't talk about economic issues, let alone rights, is that it will enable terrible governments to refocus attention away from civil and political rights. I think it's, to be undiplomatic, nonsense. I think that if you're looking at the human rights situation in a country, it's got to be seen in its comprehensive sense. It doesn't help for people to be, quote, free to do certain things if they are living in such miserable conditions uh, that they are not actually able to enjoy any of the civil and political rights they have. And to be more, and I think what you'll see in HRW is a realization at the country level that it just doesn't make sense going forward. If you take, I don't know if we're talking about a particular area of the world, if you take Lebanon, if you take Iraq, to say that economic and social rights issues are not central to the concerns of the people uh, is just, is totally wrong. And finally, if we're concerned about Palestinian rights, which seems to be a particular issue here, you'd only have to read the reports done by UNCTAD, the UN Conference on Trade and Development, which is one of the few groups that has not been intimidated out of reporting in detail on the miserable economic and social conditions in which the Palestinians are forced to live, to know that to focus solely on civil and political rights is itself doing exactly what I was accused of doing. It's presenting such a partial picture of the overall situation that it is really distorting. And I think we would be much better off if we do indeed factor in the economic and social rights part of the equation, which in no way suggests that the civil and political rights part of the equation should be downplayed or underestimated. Both of them really do interact comprehensively with one another. Wonderful. Um, with that, we are coming to the end of our time, or in fact, we've surpassed it. Um, I just want to thank you on behalf of the Nathanson Center and Osgood.
And I thank everybody here for such an engaging and delightful talk. Several mm -hmm. folks have messaged me asking for, um, for us to provide them updates on the paper when it emerges, and we will certainly do that. Um, and we will be sending you, I wish, I mean, we so wish that we could just vet you in person and, uh, you know, take you to dinner and have a drink and all those things. And, and we're dying for the day when that will be able to happen again. Um, but we're so grateful that you could make it today. Uh, we will be sending your inbox. Um, I thought I would send you, well, I thought, what, you know, what can we do as a gift? He doesn't need any more books, clearly. <laughs> so... So in lieu, in lieu of a gift certificate for a bookstore, uh, I'll just let every, you and everyone else know uh, and keep, keep an eye out, Philip, in your inbox for a gift certificate to Max Brenner Chocolates, which is a short walk away um, from the law school uh, at NYU. So thank you so, so much. We are just delighted. Uh, it's been such a pleasure. Um, we've had a huge uh, engagement online. Uh, through the live tweets, through the live streaming, through the Zoom, of course, and, and this video will live on in our archives, but also actively online, and, and we hope to continue the conversation uh, in the future. So thank you so, so much for being with us. Thanks, Heidi. Uh, it was really a, a pleasure, and I'm grateful for the invitation. Thanks again. Great. Take care, everybody. Stay well. Still alive. Ah.